Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Sharon Pepinella, and I am the program manager of Barcode Long Island. On behalf of the entire BLI team, I would like to welcome you to the eighth annual Barcode Long Island Student Symposium. We are delighted to be back in person for our symposium again this year. It is not an easy task to take on a year long research commitment under normal circumstances. So we want to commend teams for continuing to overcome obstacles to pursue their projects. The posters developed by our students, including those that will be presented today, are available to view on our DNA Barcoding 101 website. Here, you can also find information about our different DNA barcoding projects and available resources. As always, we are thrilled to see so many students taking an active interest in science research and environmental study. DNA barcoding has roots at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, where in 2003, the first barcoding meeting was held at CSHL's Banbury Center. Attending scientists were wondering if it were possible to use a certain region of code to identify, or a certain region of DNA to identify an organism in the same way in which a supermarket scanner uses a UPC code to identify a product. It turns out that not only is it possible, but it works pretty well. Shortly thereafter, the DNA Learning Center began developing tools for student-driven DNA barcoding research and 2021 marked the 10 year anniversary of the New York City based Urban Barcode Project, our first student DNA barcoding research program. For nearly 20 years, DNA barcoding has informed major advances across a variety of scientific disciplines. It has become an important tool to understand and restore ecosystems, monitor the loss of biodiversity, slow the spread of invasive organisms, survey vectors for disease, track changes in a species range, track climate change, combat poaching, and more. Additionally, DNA barcoding is being used to provide governments with information to create better policies for environmental preservation, to guide health regulations, and to protect consumer interests. In fact, a publication about the value of community scientists using DNA barcoding to identify consumer relevant fungi, published by former DNALC staff member, Christine Marizzi, was recently included in the United Kingdom policy documents about food security. DNA barcoding continues to evolve to address complex issues. Metabarcoding, a rapid and high throughput method of DNA based identification of multiple species from mixed samples, is an integrative approach to the study of global biodiversity. Metabarcoding applications are seemingly endless, from the study of the microbial composition of soil, to monitoring of marine life, to even pulling DNA from the air to identify airborne pollen, or reduce bird strikes by airplanes, or simply to get a better overall idea, idea of an ecosystem's biodiversity. With us today, our students and mentors representing the 45 DNA barcoding and metabarcoding teams that completed BLI research projects this year. We are thrilled to celebrate the efforts of these participants today. Students, the work that you are doing is part of a valuable community science effort and your dedication and perseverance make you truly great scientists. You should be extremely proud of your accomplishments. Of course, we would like to thank the teachers who mentored these student projects. Mentors, your desire to foster critical thinking, your enthusiasm for problem solving, and the time and devotion you put toward this program is made abundantly clear year after year, and we thank you for the great work that you do. And of course, it is the support given and the example set by you, the parents, family, and friends that help to show these students what they are capable of accomplishing. I'd like to say a big thank you to the Barcode Long Island team, especially our executive director, Dave Miklos, as well as the entire DNALC staff, 
for all of their work in the continued development and successful execution of our DNA barcoding programs. Thank you to all of our collaborators who continue to support our program in numerous ways. And finally, a big thank you to our original funders whom without, this, without their support, this program would not have been possible. Now it is my privilege to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Dr. Christopher J. Gobler, endowed chair and professor within the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, or SOMAS, at Stony Brook University. He received his master's degree and PhD from Stony Brook University, and in 1999 began his academic career as a professor at Long Island University. In 2005, he joined Stony Brook University as the director of academic programs for SOMAS on the Stony Brook Southampton campus. And in 2015, he was named director of the New York State Center for Clean Water Technology. He has been editor in chief of the international scientific journal, Harmful Algae, since 2018, and has published more than 200 manuscripts in peer reviewed journals that explore the linkages between anthropogenic activities and coastal ecosystems. Indeed, his work is frequently cited by, by our research students studying aquatic organisms across Long Island, especially those focused on algae biodiversity. We are excited to have him here with us today. Welcome, Dr. Gobler. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a distinct honor to be here and to see all the students here. Um, I have to say, I think the research you're doing is spectacular, very, very exciting. Um, and in fact, it's technology that I use as a college professor in my laboratory. So it's really remarkable to see all of you out there doing DNA barcoding and uh, congratulations just for just being involved in the program and to the teachers as well. I really, it's a super impressive program. So um, again, it's an honor to be here. Um, let's see how this goes together. So I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about molecular tools. You're, you're working with DNA. I'm going to talk a little bit about that and even the next step, which is RNA. So that's taking the genes that you look at and seeing how they're expressed and applying that specifically to an environmental issue here in Long Island, which are harmful algal blooms. Um, before I begin, I'll acknowledge uh, many of my coworkers who I've worked with um, what I'm about to present to you really is uh, more than, well, it's almost actually 30 years of research. I began 30 years ago as a graduate student uh, for the first time ever uh, exploring brown tides. And through the years have worked with some of the fine people you see here um, who've been engaged in the, uh, all, all the research. And I'll start out uh, on a super simple uh, level. And that is specifically with regards to what harmful algal blooms are, right? They're comprised primarily of phytoplankton, which are small single-celled organisms that are floating around in all aquatic environments, be it freshwater, marine, open ocean, and our coastal bays as well. And they're very important, of course, because they serve as the base of the food web. Um, you can see here, uh, and in fact, this has been shown around the world. The more productive these phytoplankton are, the more of them you have, the more they grow in many cases, the more the output of fisheries, right, which is feeding world populations. And that would go for both wild fisheries and even aquaculture, which is an even bigger source of food uh, for the planet today. But despite this important role they play, there are some bad actors. So of thousands and thousands of phytoplankton species that are known to science and out in the ocean, we know of dozens that form these things called harmful algal blooms. So that's when you just have one of these phytoplankton species floating around the water that grow, grow to a density then you have an, that can have a negative impact on a given ecosystem. And that impact can be anywhere from environmental to economic to public health. Uh, the ones that we worry about the most are those that can make people sick. Uh, and so there are um, many phytoplankton uh, in both marine and fresh water, probably a, a few dozen, that make biotoxins. Uh, and in marine ecosystems, when they make those toxins, you can have filter feeding bivalves, um, for example, like mussels, but it can also be clams, oysters, scallops. As they filter the water, they concentrate these cells and the toxins in them. And that can then become a vector to affecting public health. Uh, beyond the toxins, there are other classes of phytoplankton 
that thankfully we're not worried about with regards to public health, but we do worry about with regards to their ecosystem effects, because there are also dozens of phytoplankton out there that can cause things like fish kills or low oxygen conditions or even killing off uh, all sorts of marine life all the way up to actually uh, whales, in fact. And we call these ecosystem disruptive harmful algal blooms. Now, um, before I get into the details of uh, further details of, of um, harmful algal blooms, I just want to give the, a quick Long Island perspective since we're all local here. Um, and we'll call out something the idea of a watershed, right? And that the, the idea of the watershed is anywhere you go on Long Island. So I don't care where anyone lives, wherever you live in your home, as it turns out, when the water hits your yard, that water eventually has really just two fates. Um, well, I guess a, a little bit more than that, but I think of it in two ways. One, that water in general is going to seep into the water below our feet, which we call the aquifer, right? That's our drinking water source. So I don't, you know, no matter where you live, any, everyone in this room, unless you live off of Long Island or you live in Queens or Brooklyn, I don't think that is necessarily anybody here, is it? Okay, all right. So in that case, it would be different. If you, if you live in Nassau County or Suffolk County, your drinking water comes from below your feet. And so anything happening on the land is going to affect what goes into our aquifer and what you drink. And in many cases, again, excluding the people from Brooklyn or Queens, you might think, oh, well, I have city water or I have municipal water. Well, in almost every case, that water is actually not coming from more than three miles away at most. And it may be from even closer. So anything happening on land will be affecting your drinking water. Further, in both Nassau and Suffolk County, we actually have a water surplus. We don't drink all of the water that we uh, put in that goes into the ground and the excess water seeps out into surface waters. And when it seeps out in the surface waters, it can affect all of the coastal ecosystems. Uh, and that's what's being shown here. So, um, and at least in Suffolk County, and it's the case in Nassau County as well, uh, to some extent, same exact trajectory as you're, I'm showing here, but maybe offset and happening earlier. The population of Long Island grew a lot, particularly after World War II, uh, to the point where we now have, I gave a presentation to people in Nassau County today. If Nassau County was its own country, it would be the seventh most densely populated country on planet Earth. Um, and Suffolk County, with more than 1.5 million people, has more people in it than Manhattan, than Staten Island, than the Bronx, there's a lot of people, and with that, a lot of nitrogen. And so what you can see on the, um, on the right-hand panel there is the amount of nitrogen in the groundwater. It keeps going up because there's more and more people. And, uh, and we've done the studies, actually. And as it turns out, this gives you a sense of where the nitrogen's coming from, um, and mainly for Suffolk County, but also for the North Shore of Nassau County as well. And that is there's some coming from fertilizer, but there's even more coming from household, what we call septic systems. You know, the south shore of Nassau County is all sewer, but in the north shore, most of the homes are not. And Suffolk County, most of the homes are not. Uh, and that can have a big effect, as this graphic shows, on coastal water quality. Uh, and that's a lot of what my laboratory studies uh, on Long Island. This is a map we generated last September. It's really just showing just four months of data. So from June to September of last year, what was happening in our surface waters? And what the map shows is what was happening is widespread occurrence of harmful algal blooms, both in marine and inland waters, and widespread occurrence of what we call dead zones or hypoxic zones, zones of low oxygen. And in all cases, this is related to those building levels of nitrogen. So there, here on Long Island, zooming back to the harmful algal bloom front, there are both types that I've referenced in the beginning, the type that make toxins, the type that affect ecosystems. And these are new occurrences we did have one type of harmful algal bloom way, way back in the 50s uh, called green tides. This is Mauritius Bay that had a negative effect on shellfish, but also um, in Mauritius Bay when there was no inlet there. Uh, but it was also related to overloading of nitrogen from, from duck farms. But the duck farms went away and the Mauritius Inlet opened. And on Long Island, we had this 20 year period of actually being record setting. That is when it came to the harvest of hard clams, there were more hard clams harvested out of Great South Bay than any other estuary in the United States. And in fact, more than half of the clams eaten in the entire country came out of Great South Bay. 
Uh, so a remarkable record. And at the same time, we had the highest yields of scallops uh, on the eastern end of Long Island that the state had ever seen. But we started transitioning in 1985 to a period where we started to see these things called harmful algal blooms. And um, so, for example, in 1985, we had our first harmful algal bloom through something called brown tide. And then since then, there's been a progressive onset of these different types of harmful algal blooms due to seaweeds, freshwater, marine ecosystems. And you can see we're now up to eight of these particular harmful algal blooms. But probably the most damaging of all of these, historically at least, has been the very first one to occur. It's been around the longest, and that's the brown tide. Um, and this is an image of a brown tide. You can see how it gets its name. The water is discolored. Uh, if you put your hand into this water, by the time you got to your elbow, you wouldn't be able to see your fingertips. And that's because it's literally a billion cells of these small little cells within a liter of water. And that leads to the high, um, uh, the high water turbidity. Despite the fact that there's so many of them, as it turns out, this is one of the smallest organisms you can find in the water. It's only two microns in size, um, and it had never been seen before in 1985 by any scientist. So it was first discovered here, actually, in, uh, on Long Island. Uh, but it's part of a group of phytoplankton that we call pelagophytes that form these brown tides. Uh, they first occurred in the 1980s, but we've seen a global expansion since then. So in the 1990s, the brown tides on the east coast of the U.S. spread, as you can see, to mid-Atlantic states. We saw brown tides in South Africa, and a related sister species show up in Texas. Um, I began traveling to China in 2009, uh, and at that point in time, met some scientists who said, you need to investigate uh, specifically the Bohai Sea. We're starting to see something. We think it's brown tide. And I thought that, would, you know, that was nonsense. How would the brown tide in New York be uh, in China? Well, it was, actually, to form the biggest harmful algal blooms that have ever occurred on the planet with regards to size and, and environmental impact as well. Uh, and then in the last decade, we saw that brown tide that was only in Texas spread to Florida and to Cuba. So these things have been on the move. Uh, when it comes to the brown tide here in New York, which I'm going to be talking primarily about today, we know the cells are found all across the eastern seaboard, and the blooms occur essentially between Rhode Island and Virginia. And again, it's been highly impactful to New York State. Uh, it led to the collapse of the Bay Scallop fishery in the lower right. Um, it contributed to the well, it contributed to the uh, collapse of the hard clam fishery as well. The or original decline due to overharvesting, but there's been so many restoration efforts of that hard clam fishery. And every time they try to restore it, a brown tide comes and wipes out that clam fishery. And in the lower right, uh, seagrass is a very important habitat for a lot of marine life. And when you get that really turbid water, the seagrass just can't live. And so just to be perfectly honest, my almost entire academic career has focused on this one question here. Now, I study many, many other things as well. But when I first started as a graduate student, the real question was, why do we have brown tides? And, and I, I should say, if, uh, from the intro, maybe you uh, in, uh, were able to intuit it, but I grew up on Long Island. And so I remember being actually just about all of your age. I was 19 years old when I first heard about brown tide. I was just 15 when it struck for the first time. And I remember going to a lecture, much like the one you're sitting in, except in this particular case, the lecture was actually by a bayman. And he was explaining to me, well, you know, I'm a bayman. I've been a bayman my whole life. My father was a bayman. I was going to get my son to be a bayman as well, but it's over. The hard clam population in Great South Bay has collapsed. I can no longer make a living. I can't support my family. And it's all because of brown tide. And I stood there with my jaw agape, just saying, oh my gosh, what is going on here? This is, you know, this is awful. And I asked him, you know, well, what, what is brown tide? Why do we have brown tide? He didn't know. And nobody knew at the time because it was brand new to science. Uh, so when I was looking for a graduate program to study, I decided to come back to Long Island. I was at the University of Delaware at the time because I wanted to study brown tides and technically I've been doing it ever since. And the big question I've always looked at is why do they occur? And in the beginning part of my career, I used some more traditional techniques, but an opportunity came in, um, I think probably around 2005 or so, where the something known as the Joint Genome Initiative at the Department of Energy was taking on proposals to sequence whole genomes. 
Now, really, the genomic era only began technically, uh, I would, well, at the turn of the century, so to speak. So this is all new things. I put in a proposal to sequence the full genome of the brown tide. It was accepted. Uh, and we published this paper here. This was actually published in 2011, so about a decade ago. Uh, you can see many, many authors on this because the, the genome was large and there was lots to figure out. Um, you all are doing DNA barcoding, so that's kind of what this is, except instead of looking at just a single gene, we're looking at all of the genes. Right? This organism actually has 12,000 genes. Um, as it turns out, it also had a bigger genome than the competing phytoplankton it had and more genes than the competing phytoplankton it had that ha have uh, at 12,000 genes. Um, so some of the insights from, from the genome that we found, again, it has a larger genome and more genes than the competing phytoplankton. We felt this was probably a key to its dominance. And that is it had a whole suite of genes that we weren't finding in other phytoplankton that let it adapt to super low light levels. So if it forms a bloom and makes the water super turbid, it had an entire suite of genes to rely on in order to adapt to that condition. We also found out it had all sorts of genes related to the use of organic compounds uh, that, again, we did not see in other phytoplankton, and genes that might be involved with predator defense. But as you may know, genomes are great, but it just shows you the potential for an organism and what it might be able to do. But what we then wanted to really understand is what are the genes that are turning on and off when this organism is forming a brown tide that's so harmful to our marine ecosystems? What are the genes that turn on as the bloom starts and it's intensifying? Uh, and we use that question to try to understand what is the what makes this organism tick. So using not just the genome, we did that first, but then looking at what we call the transcriptome. Right? So the idea is we all have genomes. Those genomes, to do anything, need to transcribe the DNA into RNA. And then, of course, that RNA gets translated into proteins that then make metabolites. So what we, we didn't want to look at just the genome. That's what we did first, and that was great. But we wanted to know really how, what's turning on and off to make this organism tick. Um, and so looking, going, doing both laboratory studies and in the field. And so we started this gene expression work uh, in the laboratory. We grew the organism in the conditions we knew it experienced in an ecosystem setting. So low light conditions, low amounts of nitrogen, low amounts of phosphorus, which we know shows up in an ecosystem setting. And you can see in all these cases, the organism grows and then it slows down. And if you look at the, the, uh, the line there, it says replete, you can see that's a trajectory where it keeps on going. It's not running out of anything. And if we kept the experiment going, it would keep going up. We call that exponential growth. And you can see the mu there, uh, the symbol that looks like a U, that's the growth rate. So you can see that organism was growing doubling per day. Everything else was growing much slower. So we then collected these cells to look at their transcriptomes. What genes are being expressed? And we did something that I'll show throughout the rest of the presentation. We call it differential gene expression. How does the gene expression of the organism under a set environmental condition compared to a control condition where everything is good. And so in doing that, we found a bunch of pathways. Uh, I'm not gonna go over all the details here. There's a lot to assimilate, but essentially we found genes that were turning on due to low nitrogen conditions, another set of genes turning on when there were low phosphorus conditions, and yet another set of genes that would turn on when the light levels were low. So by doing this very simple laboratory study, we now had the tools to go into an ecosystem and look at an ecosystem and say, which genes are turning on during the bloom, which would let us infer the conditions that are controlling these brown tides in an ecosystem setting. And to answer that question, do we see these patterns during an actual brown tide? And on the right, you're looking at Great Salad Bay on the South Shore, on the left, Mauritius Bay, also on the South Shore. And so what we were doing, actually much like you're doing, we're just simply collecting total nucleic acids, right? But we're specifically interested in the, the RNA and not the DNA. So in that case, we make something called cDNA from the RNA. RNA is very unstable. Uh, so once we collect it, we have to make uh, complementary uh, DNA so that DNA is more stable than complementary DNA. We then sequence that uh, 
uh, and specifically do that and look at, we've looked at a few different organisms today. I'm just going to still focus on the brown tide, which is Oreococcus. So I'm going to show a few plots like this. On the x-axis, what you're looking at is time, right? And you can see it actually goes from May through uh, July, so the time period we're in right now. Uh, and what you're looking at in the brown dots is the occurrence of a brown tide. And you can see there's almost nothing in the water through May. And then suddenly, this explosive growth that occurs in June, in this case, it persisted uh, into this sort of sort of collapsing by the end of June. And I'm plotting with this as well, phosphorus levels. Orthophosphate is the type of phosphorus that most phytoplankton will use. And you can see the levels are quite low. But then towards the end of the bloom, they pop up. And as our first foray into looking into gene expression, we look specifically at one of those genes that we knew was responsive to low phosphorus conditions, a phosphorus transporter. So that is a protein that's on the outside of the cell that's very active when phosphorus levels are low, which makes sense. The organism's not getting enough phosphorus, it turns on this gene, it allows it to suck up as much phosphorus as possible. And so the pattern we saw for that specific gene, you can see it's PTA3, a high affinity phosphorus transporter, is that it was, they were, that particular gene was turned on at very high expression levels in the beginning of the bloom when the phosphorus levels were low. The organism then detects that the phosphorus levels are getting higher. It no longer needs to put the energy in to making this high affinity transporter, and then the gene is silenced. Right? So we proved that that gene is important in the lab, and now we can see uh, that it's also important um, in this ecosystem setting and even can target a level of phosphorus at which this occurs. To complement these field observations, we also sometimes conduct experiments, and that's what you're looking at here. So this is an experiment. We just took water from a brown tide and did nothing. We call that our control condition. Or the second bar, we added nitrogen. The next bar, we added phosphorus, or we added both compounds, right? And this is, on the one hand, of interest to us, but this also has important implications for protecting ecosystems. Should we restrict the amount of nitrogen or phosphorus or both compounds? So firstly, what you can see is that there's almost no difference between the control and the nitrogen in this particular experiment. A bigger response, and in fact, not only no response, what we would call a negative growth rate. So the organism as a population was dying off without having, if you didn't give, uh, if, if you gave it nothing or if you gave it nitrogen, a rebound, it began to grow with some phosphorus and then an even higher growth rate from both compounds. Now, what we also did in parallel is generate what we call metatranscriptomes from each of these experimental treatments. So that is a sequence, all of the RNA, and then we specifically looked at the gene expression of Oreococcus now in an ecosystem setting. So I'm going to show, I just I think I'll just put these up uh, to walk through them. All the plots are the same. You'll notice the x-axis is the same as well. It's all the control. And for each of these, it's a comparison of the control versus each treatment. So for the first one on the left, maybe I'll just start with that one. You can see a line that looks almost one-to-one. -one. And what that says is there's not a lot of gene expression going on, a lot of, not a lot of differences in gene expression, just two genes that were at different expression levels relative to the control and the nitrogen. In contrast, what we saw with the phosphorus, not only did it grow more, but you can see all the green dots there are a dozen or more genes that were silenced by the addition of phosphorus, suggesting that this organism was limited by phosphorus, it had all the genes that were turned on, to adapt to a low phosphorus environment, which it then turned off and began to grow quickly. And of course, following the growth patterns, we saw genes being turned on and off. So things being turned on were above the line, being turned off or below the line, uh, and by the addition of nitrogen and phosphorus. So in that case, that higher growth rate was accompanied with more genes turning on and off. The next step we wanted to do uh, beyond that experiment was looking at the uh, a brown tide and looking at the full transcriptome uh, of the organism across another brown tide. This is a few years ago, similar to the last one, but even more intense. And in fact, I can tell you, having done studies uh, before and after this, this is probably one of the most, or not even probably, this is the most br intense brown tide that had occurred on Long Island in the last decade. This occurred in Shinnecock Bay, 
uh, in Quantec Bay and Mauritius Bay, you can see the very high cell densities. This is more than a billion cells per uh, liter. This is per milliliter, so it's almost 1.5 million cells uh, per milliliter of seawater. Now, on the, the and so on the top, you're looking again that same brown tide blue. And the second graph there is the one most similar to what you're doing. This was actually some DNA barcoding, whereby we looked at what was in the water and we asked the question, who are the different organisms out there over time? And so you can see we have dates that go from early June. In fact, is today June 6th? It might be the 7th. I can't remember. 7th. Okay, so close to that just uh, a few years ago, uh, going through into August. And so what you can see on that very first date when we did our uh, meta barcoding is we saw a pretty diverse population, many things out there, but then suddenly things changed. And in the month of June going into July, up to 90% of the barcodes that came back were due to brown tide, right? So not only was it very high in cell densities, it was also one of the most abundant things in the water. Now, beyond that, we looked at it's global gene expression. Now, this is a lot to look at, and you don't really need to look at any of the things on the right. They're different, just different, uh, what we call biochemical pathways. But what I want you to be able to see is that during that period when the brown tide was most abundant, you can see perhaps that the genes that were at different expression levels, that pattern in the middle of that bloom is different than before and after. And what I have up there up top is the growth rate of the organism. So it grows very, very quickly in the beginning. It doesn't grow much in the middle. It's sort of stagnant. And then it's actually having a negative growth rate as it dies off. And so what we found is during that initiation period, when it's having that explosive growth, we saw distinct sets of cells, uh, excuse me, metabolic pathways that were being upregulated. Uh, specifically those associated with DNA replication and the cell cycle, which of course is going to be very, very important if things are growing very quickly. In the middle of the bloom, oops, in the middle of the bloom during the peak, um, we saw things more related to uh, carbon fixation, which is photosynthesis and the carbon cycle, and also fatty acid uh, biosynthesis and degradation, which actually takes us back that very first laboratory experiment, under low light in the lab when we grew it, that low light condition also upregulated the fatty acid biosynthesis and degradation. So we get a signal that this organism at this point in time was adapting to low light conditions. And then finally, as you can see how different the colors are there, different colors mean either genes being up or down regulated basically. And we saw a very strong down regulation of almost everything as we'd expect when the bloom collapsed. Looking at some specific genes, we saw in the beginning of the bloom, genes related to phosphorus were at higher expression levels, whereas in the middle of the bloom, when it was most intense, we saw the expression of genes related to nitrogen. Uh, and along with this, as I showed you previously, the TDP and TDN are total dissolved nitrogen, total dissolved phosphorus. Levels of phosphorus were low when those genes were expressed in the very beginning, whereas when the phosphorus levels were higher, those, those uh, conditions, those genes were silenced. Uh, and in the middle of the bloom, when there was stress from nitrogen, um, well, that's, actually those levels didn't change as much. But knowing these overall patterns that we saw the bloom was different from the initiation to the peak to the end, we then wanted to perform experiments similar to what we had done before to understand what is the role of nitrogen and phosphorus at different phases of the bloom. Um, so we did experiments very similar to what you saw before, those three different time points. And when we started, we got a result similar to what I showed you before, that phosphorus seemed to be the most important uh, gene in, um, excuse me, most important nutrient in promoting this population. Uh, and we saw that, I'm not going to go through the details of what this kind of plot is, but saw that each different treatment separated out. And we saw that phosphorus elicited a very strong response in genes being upregulated, and that nitrogen and phosphorus together did the same thing, but not much of a response from nitrogen in the beginning. When we got to the peak of the bloom, we saw that actually nitrogen ended up being more important than phosphorus. And of course, there was also a co-effect. I won't go over the details of that. 
But simply to say, when we looked at all the biochemical pathways, similarly, the nitrogen addition made the, all of these different pathways turn on. Uh, whereas again, a mutant response now in the middle of the bloom from phosphorus or both compounds. And finally, by the end of the bloom, we needed both nitrogen and phosphorus to make this bloom go. Uh, and, but the gene expression patterns were quite uh, muted. So the, the, the thing I would emphasize then is that at least for this particular harmful algal bloom, very clearly, the organism itself is telling us that nitrogen and phosphorus are important compounds for this, for this organism to form a bloom. And the relative importance changes over the course of the bloom. Phosphorus to start the bloom, nitrogen to maintain it. And so that approach, while this is maybe um, what you can call, well, it's molecular science, we can use this to actually inform management plans. We need to limit the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus into our coastal waters if we want to get rid of these brown tides. And if we only limit, for example, the nitrogen, well, the blooms are still going to take off. They might end a little bit quicker. And if we only were to limit the phosphorus, well, you know, eventually the phosphorus levels tick up by the end of the season. So you might just be pushing the bloom to later in the season. So we need both. And that's something that, you know, in, in te technically uh, there have not been a lot of studies that have used a molecular approach to identify remedial approaches in an ecosystem setting. Got a little error message here. Is this a responsive? Hopefully my AV person's going to be able to. Oh, taken care of, I think. Okay, great. All right. Going to take a little sidestep here away from nutrients and now talk about some marine biology. Uh, I showed you in the very beginning, my first slide was a food chain. Right, and so who can tell me what eats phytoplankton? Anybody have the answer to that? What eats phytoplankton in the ocean, sir? Correct, okay. And so this is a very simple formula here to say that the bloom is controlled by things like nutrients, but if there's a predator out there that is consuming the organism, it doesn't matter how, many, how much nutrients you put in there, the organism will be eaten and it'll never form a bloom. So the same experience we did before, we had one other treatment we also tried. No, I finally discovered that I have a pointer. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, that'll get everybody excited. They say that cats like to follow pointers. So if I keep doing this, it'll keep everybody quite excited. Um, so there's a little zooplankton that we use. It's all actually a protist. You can see the name here, Oxyrius marina, marina being for marine ecosystem. Um, and so you've already seen these sorts of plots before, but look at now here, we had another treatment where we added in this, this zooplankton. We grow it in the lab and we add it into the seawater. And what I want you to see is here's the brown tide oreococcus. Here's something it's competing with known as synecococcus. And what I want you to see here is the idea, remember this is again our control where we do nothing, is that for synecococcus, the competing phytoplankton, we add the predator and as we'd expect, its growth rate goes down. So this predator is eating the synecococcus, the competing phytoplankton. But remarkably, not only is the growth rate of oreococcus, the brown tide, not changing when we added a predator that we know can eat it in the laboratory, in an ecosystem setting, not only is its growth rate not changing, it's going up. It's actually growing faster in the presence of a predator. And when you have this differential dynamic, the competitor dies and the other organism grows faster, that tells you you're onto a mechanism that may be facilitating these blooms. I showed you gene expression results already for nitrogen, for phosphorus, for both compounds. And in all of these plots here, the way to look at it is if you see a gray dot, no change in expression level, a red dot is an up regulation above the line, down regulation below the line. And the number of genes being differentially expressed up and down are shown in the upper left and right. Uh, respectively. What I want you to see is obviously, if your eye hasn't already focused on it, the lower right panel. And what this is telling us is that why we got maybe the biggest treatment of the nutrients was maybe 200 genes up regulated, 200 genes down regulated. The brown tide was going crazy, transcriptionally speaking, in the presence of this predator, with 1,600 genes being upregulated and more than 2,200 being downregulated. 
So a very strong, what we call transcriptional response here. And, uh, and very different when we did some statistical analyses as well. Also, when we look at all the metabolic pathways, again, a little bit of response out of the nutrients, but that zooplankton grazer had an enormous effect. And you can see all the different pathways being upregulated or downregulated by that predator. We also looked at some specific genes, uh, gene sets from the genome that we pulled out. And I'll just call your attention to one. This is our name, toxin genes. But when we published the genome paper more than a, a decade ago, we identified a series of genes that might be important for predator defense. And as you can see, those genes are being highly upregulated uh, when exposed to the grazer. So to be get a better control on this, we actually went back to the laboratory and did an experiment where we took the brown tide, grew it normally, grew it in the presence of that grazer, and even did something we call indirect grazing, whereby can the grazer, just by eating the oreocaca cells, affect neighboring oreocaca cells? So that is, can the brown tide sense that some of its neighbors are being eaten? Are there what we would call infochemicals being released? that may alter gene expression. And so when we did this experiment, well, firstly, we saw different patterns of gene expression that's shown here. And when we looked at whether we had high or low cell densities, direct grazing, what we called that indirect grazing, we saw the strongest response from the direct grazing. And of all the different pathways that turned on and off, here's the one that was the most responsive something known as the biosynthesis of secondary metabolites. Well, secondary metabolites are compounds that are made that aren't important necessarily to grow, but potentially to defend an organism against its predators. So it looks like in addition to the nitrogen and phosphorus being important, this organism is sensing predators about it. It's making compounds that then make potentially the brown tide a less uh, palatable or less palatable um, algal species, so the predators don't want to eat it, and that also allows it to form the bloom. Okay, very last thing I'm going to talk about is what I started in the introduction on, and that is the fact that the brown tide is harmful to marine life. Uh, as shown here, the yields of scallops and on Long Island and in New York in the 70s and early 80s were the highest of all time. We've never returned to those levels. With the very first brown tide, you can see what happened. Decades long yields of hundreds of thousands of pounds of scallops down to almost nothing. Uh, and you know this stops in 2010. There's a little bit of recovery, but it really has never recovered. Uh, and we know it's because that the brown tide has an ill effect on scallops. And if you've never seen a scallop up close, it is one of the most beautiful organisms you'll ever see. These little blue dots are what are called eyes. It has these sort of tentacles that go out and can sense the environment. Um, and, you know, I'm sure, well, I don't know, but they're also delicious <laughs> uh, in addition to being beautiful. So the last thing I want to talk about is looking at the transcriptome now of the scallops exposed to the brown tides. Can we understand why the brown tide is harmful by looking at gene expression of the, the animal itself? Uh, and so we did a series of experiments uh, to look at different stressors. We looked at the brown tide, of course. We also looked at things like high temperatures, ocean acidification, and other harmful algal blooms. And that's shown here. Again, nice experiment we set up. Always make sure you have a control treatment for your experiments. And then did the low pH treatment, a high temperature treatment. We looked at the brown tide and one other type of harmful algal bloom. Um, when we looked at the survival of the scallops, this is what we found. Now, this is the, the larval stage of the scallops. So even under control conditions, we only got somewhere around 40% survival, which is actually pretty good. We think in an ecosystem setting, larval survival is less than 1%. Um, but what you can see is that each individual treatment suppressed survival. Turns out the two harmful algal blooms were the most suppressive. That one, this one, Margolifidinium, you can see in just a day or a couple of days caused almost 90% uh, mortality in the scallops. Whereas the brown tide actually in the end caused about the same level of mortality, but it took more time. These plots are complex, but what they show are um, 
these are Venn diagrams showing genes that are turned on and turned off. And really what we can focus on, all these are the interactions. We can just focus on the numbers up here that are in the parentheses. So what I want you to see is that, you know, high, low pH and high temperature, there was genes being turned on and off, but the responses were much stronger to the harmful algal blooms. And what's very interesting is that the two different types of harmful algal blooms yielded the exact opposite gene expression results. Whereas when exposed to margolefidinium, there was a very strong upregulation of genes. Whereas for oreococcus, there's a very strong suppression of genes. And you can see that there. Uh, and were you to look at these, uh, this sort of what we call heat map, you can just see again, genes turned on by the margolefidinium and largely turned off uh, by oreococcus. And I won't go into the details here, but well, maybe I'll just talk a little bit about this, but the details aren't important. When we looked at genes related specifically to antioxidant responses um, and even something called heat shock proteins, all these things, we would call these stress responses. What the organism, the scallop was telling us is that it was ramping up its stress responses in the presence of the margolefidinium or coccolidinium, but suppressing the responses with regards to oreococcus. So, and we think that's because of the mechanism. The organisms have trouble feeding on oreococcus, which leads to a suppression overall of the physiology. Whereas this organism, coccolidinium, so have margolefidinium, releases dangerous, um, what we call reactive oxygen species, and therefore it must upregulate these pathways to protect itself. Okay, well, with that, I'm at my conclusions. Um, so I've showed you that sequencing the oreococcus genome and transcriptomes have led to a series of key insights when it comes to brown tides. So firstly, that the bloom changes over the course, uh, the responses change over the course of a bloom. Uh, and then over the course of the bloom, it shifts from phosphorus limitation to nitrogen limitation. Again, as revealed by what the organism is telling us by the genes that are turning on and off over the course of a bloom. And again, this has important management implications because it tells us we need to restrict both types of nutrients um, in our coastal waters. Um, it looks like the predator avoidance pattern that we saw in experiments that the grazer is going after the competitor, but not after brown tide is because there's a bunch of secondary metabolites that the organism is starting to synthesize that makes it le less palatable, less editable, less edible. Uh, and therefore that also promotes uh, these blooms. And that the mortality in bivalves like scallops due to brown tides are down due to the depressive effect that oreococcus has on various protective pathways. So with that, I again, thank my collaborators and I thank all of you for your kind attention. Okay, so we have just about seven minutes or so for some questions for our speaker. So I can either pass the microphone around or there's two microphones in the middle of the room that you can go up to if you have any questions. So you can either raise your hand and head up to a microphone. Oh, you're far away, okay. and in South Africa? That's a great question. And it relates to one of my favorite um, axioms in microbial ecology. And the axiom is, when it comes to microbes, everything is everywhere and the environment selects. And so over the years, I've had colleagues across the planet do metabarcoding, just like you're doing. And they say, the strangest thing just happened. I just finished a cruise in Antarctica and we did some barcoding. And the brown tide from Long Island is showing up in Antarctica. And, and I'll get the same email from someone in the Galapagos uh, and somewhere, as I said, in Africa and in China. And in fact, 
there was a recent study uh, that I performed with some collaborators in China, essentially showing that digging down through the sediments, proving that the brown tide has been there for thousands of years and covers the entire coastline. And so all of this data leads me to the hypothesis that I think has yet to be refuted, that this organism is everywhere and that it's usually at very, very low levels, almost undetectable, and has probably been for thousands of years. It didn't just show up in Long Island in 1985, but in 1985, the conditions on Long Island changed enough for it to have the right environmental conditions to form a very dense brown tide. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Other questions? So what is uh, what is the relationship between the brown tie and the global climate change? Okay, so the question, if you didn't hear it, was the relationship between brown tides and global climate change. I can mostly talk about that from a local perspective. Every organism on the planet has a temperature optimum. And so a general axiom for climate change and organisms in the ocean is that as our planet warms, organisms will begin to migrate towards the poles to stay in their thermal optimum. And so the implications on the East Coast of the US and elsewhere are twofold. One, that means that ecosystems at higher latitudes in the near future may become vulnerable to brown tides. In the past, that might not have been the case and it maybe never got warm enough, but now they will. The other implication, particularly for us, but also other things that we've, I've already seen this in the mid-Atlantic, the brown tide actually starts to collapse when water temperatures get too high. So the other implication this can have is it may start shifting the blooms to earlier in the season. Or alternatively, if we accept that it's both the light and temperature window that's ideal for the brown tide, it could actually lessen the occurrence of brown tides if it also needs that high solar irradiance that you get, say, in June when it typically forms these blooms. Um, so those are the ways that it may be changing with regards to global climate change. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. Probably have time for one more question. Ask me anything. And I actually mean do mean that. You don't have to ask me about brown tide. You can ask me about anything. What was the most challenging challenging thing you faced throughout your experiment? Great question. And um, well, I mean, there's, there are many because there's been many experiments. As a scientist, you always are looking for funding to support that research. Um, but, you know, there's always going to be failures in science. And there's always going to, and I had many, many failures. I'll never, my, my master's degree that should have taken me two years took me more than three because I had a series of failures. My cultures wouldn't grow. I had to work up a new method and it didn't work out. So, um, uh, you know, that's part of science. I always tell my graduate students, no experiment works out. The, no good experiment works on the very first try. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's thank our speaker one more time.